The nominations for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series are Peter Falk for Columbo. James Earl Jones for Gabriel's Fire. Michael Moriarty for Law and Order. Scott Bakula for Quantum Leap. And Kyle McLaughlin for Twin Peaks. The Emmy goes to... Come on, Luke. Ooh, James Earl Jones. It's award season. It is for podcasting. The 12th annual podcast award nominations are now open until July 31st. You can vote Twin Peaks Unwrapped and get us nominated in two categories. The People's Choice and TV and Film. That's awesome. That's so cool. So you please visit www.podcastawards.com. All you have to do is click on the nominations, our open banner, sign up, then vote. It is that easy. It will take less than five minutes of your time. You only have until July 31st when they close voting. So please visit podcastawards.com today. Welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is... Brian Kozowska. Hi, Brian. <laughs> hey, Ben. How's it going? Good. What's up? We got Rob, Rob King, from 25 Years Later, on the phone, and we're going to be talking about David Lynch's Room to Dream. Which we are spoiling. We're going to go deep into it. Yeah. And But first, Rob, you know, the last time you were on the show, we were talking about the Max, and uh, we had that show because it was, what, the 25th anniversary of the yeah. Max, I believe? And, Rob, you, you posted on Twitter that, oh, they're talking about having the Max return. Yes. And I think that was the first I had heard about this, and then what was it? I don't know if it was a week later, there was more information about it. He posted a picture of the Max and Batman together. What? <laughs> yeah, it was really unexpected for me. I I didn't see that coming. And, and, and if I remember correct, 25 years later, was trying to do kind of a cult TV segment. We were figuring out our way yeah. to, to bring in an audience once maybe some of the Twin Peaks got a little stretched and tired for some, and we wanted to kind of invigorate it. And so I did the MTV series The Head and then The Max as kind of my cult TV, and then it, it kind of segued into Twin Peaks. And, Loved and it. then it kind of became a fan researching the piece but this new batman uh <laughs> it, yeah that completely baffles me i'm gonna buy it i'm, I'm still gonna get it i mean it's mm. funny because like the, the description is something like the outback is gonna take part in this and, and the max and somehow i think i don't know if we're gonna go into batman's dream world or whatever mm. but it's like you're still gonna have these dream elements that i enjoy with the max so i'm i'm willing to give it a shot but what i'm really hoping is if it's popular enough maybe they really would do a, a legit <laughs> The Max series, like a new series, would yeah. be really cool. But right, and I think you had reached out to Sam Keith at the time or yeah. his lawyers, and they said that he couldn't speak at the time. It makes me wonder if it wasn't because they were waiting on this release. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, yeah, I did reach out to uh, Sam Keith's people, and they said he wasn't interested in taking interviews at this time. And I do, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think maybe he knew something was coming down the line, and they couldn't talk. It makes and, total sense. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So we're here to talk about the new book, Room to Dream, and I want to start off, Rob, that you are doing a series for 25 Years Later site, and I, could you tell us a little bit about that series you're working on? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So when, I, I guess I'm trying to remember what it was, but uh, just about a month before the release, it, it finally hit me, you know, I'll bet there's some advanced reading copies of this out there, I'll, I'll just look. And so I went on eBay and I found a copy, and... That Laurie's name is written on the front. Whoever Laurie is, thank you. Um, <laughs> it, 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 so I got to read a little bit ahead of it, and so I had already proposed to Andrew that, hey, this biography is coming out. Is that something we want to go ahead and cover? Because we usually stick mainly to media, television, and film. And he said, well, it's Lynch. This is what everyone's going to want to read. We're doing it. Awesome. So little by little, I said, well, man, I 
you, we have this lynch night series we do on Thursday nights. And I said, you know, maybe we could kind of get everybody involved and everybody could handle a chapter. And what I found is that got a little unwieldy. Some people signed up, some did not. But by the end of it, it all worked out. And we have about four writers working on the series. I think it's in about eight parts. The first part, we covered the first maybe 100 pages that kind of was covered in the documentary that came out about a year ago, the David Lynch, The Art Life. Mm -hmm. Kind of covers his life, like with the early, through the short films, and then his, and it's really focused on his painting, and he let the cameras follow him. And it, he really speaks up through his years in Philadelphia and into Eraserhead. It just felt right that we would cover all of that at once, like the documentary. And so Paul Billington kind of wrote his piece, and I wrote, and then we sent each other six questions, three spoilers three non-spoiler and answer back and forth and then I took over and wrote the pieces I, I'm finished writing mine there you can find them at 25 years later and it's our room to dream series that we're kind of emulating the title of the return we're calling it a limited event book club series ah, cool. and so it'll run eight parts and uh paul billington will take the next two so he's going to cover the sections that look at twin peaks and uh lost highway and then uh stuart gardiner will take on the next two and jc is going to round it out Nice. Wow. We do categorize them, and you can kind of filter it out up at the top under, oh, I think we have Lynch Night. And if you go to the tab that says Lynch, go to Lynch Night, it'll, they will all come up. And we're just going to do them one after the other, so they should be pretty easy to track. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm excited by this. I think to go to your webpage and to have the information of saying, oh, all the Twin Peaks stuff is one you got in one article. I can look it up easily, and or you know, Lost Highway or whatever. And I think it's a great resource. I think you guys are providing a great resource. Yeah, and I really oh, thank you. Yeah, we're having fun with it. I really like part one where you did have that kind of back and forth between Paul. I thought it was. Re I was like, look, it went to part two, and it's like, oh, it's a different format now. But I was like, oh, I didn't know if this was going to be the standard format. But it's really nicely done. Oh well, thank you very much. Yeah, that was the ambitious ideas that we could do that for each, but just. With with everybody's schedules, it was it was too difficult to continue. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting, and I don't know if everybody realizes, so we have this book, and then of course you have an audio book version of this, but there's things in it that are different. What is her name? Christine McKenna. It seems like she did the interviews, she did this whole thing, and she would do a piece of it. I guess she said a chapter, but it seems, and then Lynch would read that, and he would answer what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And it appears to me, anyways, that he was recorded the whole time he's doing this interview, and some of it is used in the audio book. Is very what it cool. Appears. Yeah. But it's strange because there'll be stuff in the book that is not in the audio book, and there's stuff in the audio book that is not in the book. It's like it didn't translate well, so it's like, I don't you know. know. What do you think, Rob? Why Why did they do this? Uh, you know, I, I've wondered the same thing, and I've asked it, uh, and I've gotten different answers, but the, I know that my feeling reading it, so I work at a special collections where we do oral histories, and so when I write about it, I always have to call it a biography slash memoir, because you kind of have the biography portion that McKenna's worked on, and then his memoirs, and the sense that I got reading it the first time was that he would read the research and everything that uh, Christine had put together, and then he would, you know, you kind of picture him going and to a studio with his coffee and his cigarettes and he would just start reminiscing or telling his version of mm -hmm. what he was reading answering it but then i got the audiobook and i was as shocked as all of you i'm like oh this is completely different maybe not completely different but man he's giving us different details yes in Even some stories. parts more so and yeah. in other parts less and so what i decided is he said i want to sit back down and i had it marked at some point in the audible version it was like chapter seven and i forget which minute but he makes the statement i would elaborate on that story but i talked about that in the book <laughs> right it's already been mentioned wow. in the book here so you can go relate to that yeah that's cool that's Isn't cool something right it's almost like the book is done it's got to go to be published and then they're still tinkering with it a little bit for the audiobook like she didn't name sabrina southern in the book mm -hmm. but then when she gets to the audiobook she says oh and lynch is in a house producer sabrina sutherland hmm but it's like, why did you add that in, in the audiobook and not in the actual book? I don't know. You don't have to think too hard about it. I, I think do. It, I, <laughs> I think it's probably just one of those things, like maybe maybe they left her name out of the book for a reason. 
No, yeah, maybe. Maybe. But the other thing is that the audiobook says it's unabridged. So I always think unabridged means you get the yeah. full book. Yeah. But you're, there's things that are... In Lynch, Lynch is a rambler, though. We, he does kind of well, go off on tangents. He goes off on tangents, and the book is mostly made up of anecdotes. Like, mm, yeah. like small little anecdotes. Like, it's not like a whole chapter about my father. You know, mm. it's, a, it's a, well, this happened, and then this happened. And there was like... And one time he's like talking about his girlfriend. He's like, my girlfriend got spanked at school. And then the next thing he's talking about because something completely different. I think we went on a field trip or something. It's like, wait a minute, this has nothing to do with. Why did you tell me that story about your girlfriend I, getting spanked? You know what? <laughs> I haven't heard the audio like you guys yet, but I get the feeling this is sort of like Mark Frost and David Lynch making Twin Peaks. David Lynch does the pilot and or you know does that dream sequence, and then someone deciphers it. So in this way. Lynch tells these stories, and then you have someone who's a writer, professional writer, says, I have to make this work on written form. It can't be confusing for the, yeah. the reader. But the audio can be... It's like jazz. It's like, yeah. it's just whatever. And saying you know? all that, for me, I mean, I wouldn't want Lynch any other way. Like, I love mm. the audiobook because you get to hear Lynch, yeah. like raw Lynch. You get to hear him who yeah, he yeah. is, and I love uh. it for who he is. And the only thing I just want to say, you know, sometimes, especially us, we we put all this meaning into his work. It's like, oh, this happened over here, and this happened over there, and how do they all connect? And, you know, you're listening to Lynch, he's like, well, maybe they don't connect. Maybe Lynch just wants to share this, and he wants to share that. Yeah. I'm sitting here with uh, all these... Uh, uh, Lynch books next to me. You've got uh, David Olson's, David Lynch, uh, Beautiful Dark, and The Complete Lynch. Of course, we had Lynch on Lynch, Catching the Big Fish. Oh, yeah. And so the way I've become to, started to think about it, and I, I don't know which is vice versa, if all of those books, those biographies that everyone worked so hard on and got those recollections are kind of like the fire walk with me of David's life, then this <laughs> book really feels like the missing pieces. I like that. Mm. And that they're all, you need all of it to fill in the details. And my feeling with the audiobook is that he truly did an interview response with McKenna to get the printed book. But then they set him down again to do the audiobook, and there was just no way he was going to retread the territory he had already tread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. The first <clears throat> section is about American pastoral. What we are learning in this is his his early life. It's so moving around with his family. So you're getting lots of family memories, lots about his father and working with the trees, which begins that kind of narrative that we all know we've kind of tracked and when I look at this of course what happens in our brains is we want to track it through the works that we're familiar and comfortable with which are the movies but he tells this story of being in Spokane with a child and I was just fascinated at his ability to, to recollect it he and his friend through this kind of built up snow found an open apartment mm. and they go in and he tells a story of packing snowballs and <laughs> putting them in the drawers and putting them on the bed he gets to the end of this story and you're thinking what is going on what were these kids thinking uh putting towels in the street and watching the cars roll over them <laughs> and then his dad gets called uh, of course that evening and ends up having to spend a lot of money and in the book it, he has a line that says something like why did we do it go figure <laughs> and I love that. And then you're listening to the audiobook, and he tells the story, and he gives you none of that. Uh, he just tells the story, and you're like, why would he tell me that story? So I, I love the recollections that he has in there. It, that stuck out to me. And in the documentary, The Art Life, uh, he tells a story about a neighbor, Mr. Smith, and they were going to move to Spokane. And in the movie, he gets emotional. And he says, I can't tell that story. It's too much. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, of course, the dark is the worst thing when we try and imagine what this story was. And you get to the book, and it's just simply that Mr. Smith shook his hand and gave him a kindness. Uh, hmm. And that meant everything to him. Uh, yeah. So, so those yeah. are some of the stories that stuck out with me. Lynch has always said, oh, I'm an Eagle Scout. And like, I always think of him as like, even though he does crazy movies, I was like, oh, he's like a goody goody two shoes. And he's just like by the book and like kind of a Cooper, I guess. But then you're hearing uh, that you're reading this book and he's not like, at all. Like, he is such a troublemaker. He's got bombs. Go <laughs> he's got friends playing with bombs. And like, he just seems like he likes to. <laughs> he's, he's a boy. I mean, he's, yeah, he's a boy. I mean, he's not he's not really a bad person or no. anything, but he gets into himself into trouble from time to time. Yeah, I, I think that snowball story kind of like echoes throughout the book from where I've gotten to so far, but he's always making messes. Yeah. And people, like, you know, he makes messes later on, and his dad has to pay for it. Right. And then he himself rents an apartment, and he just 
leaves paint and paints things, and it's not his property. Yeah. But it seems like that uh-huh. snow ball story echoes every chapter it's not like he's doing maliciously right he's just that's the kind of person he is in some ways it, he's got his creative energy yes he's doing things that are <laughs> yeah yeah and something i liked was that he, you know his parents took it serious when he had I, the whole family had any ideas and they were all about they were very much about projects mm. and i think that's amazing at a young age that his family took interest in like woodwork or whatever he was doing and for him to grow up in that kind of environment you know this is going to lead to his years in philadelphia which is such a different world from his childhood yeah but one thing i would say about him being that boy in that kind of is he got to be that during a time when you could kind of do that Mm -hmm. he's making the bombs uh, Mm -hmm. you know the latchkey kids hadn't come just yet Uh, the, the kids were not completely on their own they still were called to dinner he was in a very specific time in America that we call kind of the good old days quote unquote (laughs) reading about his life and the way he points things out I I think you do see kind of the bugs in the soil there Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I really like that story about his grandfather his mom and his grandmother asked him to go visit the grandfather and he he got sidetracked you know on his bike and he's like oh yeah I gotta go see my grandfather he's out with his grandfather and they just kind of have a great time talking and then his grandfather's like okay I gotta go and so then he he takes off and he's like ah I'm gonna go see my friend and let's let's see if we can blow up something again and and all of a sudden there's sirens and he's like oh no they hear the bomb I gotta get out of here and he goes home and he realizes his grandfather is ill and he's in the hospital and he dies and he was thinking the sirens were because of the bomb and realizing most likely those sirens were related to his grandfather but I really like that story the, the next chapter is the art life. A lot of the stories I've heard before about Bushnell, his friend Toby Keeler's father was a painter, and and Lynch thought, oh, you're a house painter? It's like, no, no, you're an art painter, and that's what kind of inspired him to yeah. get into painting. I mean, I've heard that story, it seems like a million times through different places, but it's still interesting. I was just thinking all these different names that, you know, Bushnell becomes part of Twin Peaks, and then yes. he has uh, Nancy Briggs, the, you know, the Briggs family. There's a lot of names. I've I, the first thing I noticed in this chapter was the names that all come that remind me of Twin Peaks or mostly Twin Peaks. And the one name that stands out, and I don't know if anybody else gets this out of it, is Judy. You know, there's a Judy in his life that could possibly be the girl that got away. The girl that got away, he loved her. She goes to college. They see each other maybe a chapter or two later. He he visits her in college. He looks like a homeless person. <laughs> She's all dressed up with her girlfriends. And he says that's the last time they ever spoke. The girls are all kind of like giggling and going, what? what's wrong with this guy? But it's interesting that Judy, to me, and then you have Firewalk With Me, let's not talk about Judy, makes me think about that Judy and not Judy Garland now. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys think? Happy coincidence? Yeah. Maybe. You know, uh, it, he just these names just carry into the world, and of course, <laughs> Judy is so open. But yeah, yeah I, I got that sense when I read it, and I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Mm. You know, every time I saw a name that connected in the slightest way to one of these materials, I, I, I probably started overthinking it. Yeah, I mean, we all do. I think in the Lynch world, yeah. I feel like we're almost like programmed to overthink it. Right. But it's clear that he is incorporating a lot of his work and his life into. His, yeah. His work. I mean, yeah. 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 They absolutely overlap. Definitely. Oh, right. And you know, you talk about love. I mean, like he he he's, he had girlfriends since he was in kindergarten. Like this guy, I know. <laughs> this guy gets around. I mean, I don't know. He seems like he he's in love a lot. I mean, he, I forget that he has had four wives, and he just seems like he dated a lot, and he fell in love and out of love often. I mean, I say often over. You know. No, in these first couple of chapters, you're right. It is a lot. Like he'll go he, from he, one girl he, to he another. Date two girls at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Or he'll be dating one girl, he'll like another girl. Or his and then, best friend's girl. He yes, like that. and they're <laughs> still friends, the guy, you know, and, uh, like, it's crazy. Uh, He's a ladies' man. Right. Yeah. It, it, and I'm scared to even touch that because it seems to follow throughout the book, which, of course, represents to some degree his life. And I feel like that's going to end up being its own article on 25 years later at some point. Yeah. Uh, you know, these these relationships and the tendency throughout his life and then what it means to the art. That's definitely a note that I think you hear all the way through the return section love that could come and go and what these relationships mean to him Mm -hmm. in comparison to the art life. 
We had Chris Rodley on, and in a few weeks, I think we'll have the second part dealing with Lynch on Lynch. And oh, he, great. And at one point, he brings up about Rossellini and how Lynch just kind of fell out of love. I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. What, what are you saying? Like, I always thought that was like... He was just like talking off the cuff, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I was thinking, I was saying to him, "Do you want me to edit this out? Like, this seems awful that you're." It's almost like gossip or something. I was like, "Are you really saying this?" And then we have this book, and Rossellini is basically saying, "Yeah, he kind of called me up and <laughs> he was done." And it's just like, yep. it's like, wow! I was like, uh, <laughs> he follows his heart, right? Yeah. Uh, Smiling bags of death. Another Twin Peaks nod. Yes, from season two, the giant has three things to say. Mm -hmm. One of them is a smiling bag. It was the body bag that Cooper received with the hospital, the morgue, wherever he was. Right. And so Lynch, I guess, would go to the morgue, right, and he'd Mm -hmm. see this hanging up, and that's what it made him think of. He saw dead bodies. Oh, yeah. Which doesn't make, I mean, you know that Lynch has this weird underbelly of uh, this create this darkness and he was just not bothered by seeing dead bodies and i'm reading that going i can't believe it and he's just like dead animals don't bother him dead bodies don't bother him but he's him. being exposed to this and like i mean and he, he he chose to though he's like can i go in the morgue i yeah. want to go in he asked to and i'm like wow and one time his father and him were home and there was a mouse and he got a bat and just like stomped it. and the mouse went into clothing and he just like slammed it until it was dead but to me it was like it seemed vicious and it's like wow was his father angry or he just was wanted to get that mouse dead he didn't get into tm uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, being a parent, I'm always I I, I think sometimes I'm, I'm I'm intrigued by when we we talk about Lynch's uh, children, and it's funny in the book. They briefly talk about the birth of Jennifer Lynch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you know, like it was—it wasn't common for uh, the father to go in for, during birth. Like they usually stay, wait in the waiting room. But he really wanted to do it, and he proved to the doctor that he could handle it. Yeah. And in the book, it seems very quick, but in the audio book, Lynch says it was very beautiful and powerful. This experience. It's like, wow, how, why are you cutting that? And then it goes on. They took Jen home in a cab, and the cab driver says, "May Jennifer's life be a beautiful as the day." Cause the day was really a beautiful day, sunny day. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then Lynch goes on to say about how when he was home, he brought the neighbor kids in. He would bring them in one at a time, and they get to see Jennifer. And the, but you, this whole story, all this stuff is cut from the book, and it's like wow. Like in, in the book, you have Lynch in the in the delivery, and then all of a sudden, it's kind of like parents have their thing, and kids have their thing, and this generation about how we have to like be at their baseball games and have to do all this. I, my parents didn't do that, and I think this is just, you know, he just thinks it's all silly. But it's like, it almost come, to me, it comes off almost colder as a parent. And, like, you lose all this stuff in the audiobook about how he saw it was a beautiful experience and how much he loved his daughter. I, I was I just shocked that this wasn't I almost book. feel that Lynch doesn't want to repeat himself. So this was probably recorded is after. Re- they always say he doesn't like talking head stuff, interviews. He doesn't like that. So I kind of feel like Lynch is probably like, I want to probably elaborate more. Or The interview, I think, is the raw interview. I think what he's recording, the audio part, that is the original interview. And then it must be between... This um, would be a great question for her when <laughs> we have her on the show. You know what, Ben, you make a great point. It does sound a little cold when I read the book. It does. He does say, you know, having a kid, it gets in the way, or he t- kind of says it doesn't change. He doesn't change how he is. Yes, like he's an artist kid. first, right, and then a father second. Really, he. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not the art, the art life. Yeah, I'm not being a jerk when I say that, but that's how he comes off. I think that's the key is this art life and how he sees it. And there, there's something to the power differential uh, of David Lynch and these people in his lives, where they are equally. Uh, protective and careful with him and they want him to have this life Mm. where he gets to continue creating there is invested it seems and he can have this uh, i think as jennifer calls it in the next section uh, this kind of wildly romantic part about him but he can also completely separate himself from family from these relationships and devote himself completely to the art and this seems absolutely normal to him Mm. even though it comes off cold to us i think yeah. Yeah. And when you read it, it comes off cooler. Now, I'm very interested to hear the audiobook because to me, what you just said, Ben, 
it, it gives a little more softness and right. more uh, I mean, heartfeltness. But I mean, like he, he's saying how beautiful Jennifer is and how mm. powerful or how powerful this is, and then to say like, hey, I, I wanted the kids to come by and see this. So I felt like he had a, multiple times where he's saying what an amazing experience this is, and it's just so weird to me that the book kind of almost glosses over that, mm. and and you just kind of get it yeah. left with things are sure different from th- when it used to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The next section is uh, Spike. So that's about the eraser head years, and. Uh, uh, part of what you get in the early section of that is Garden Back. I speak a little bit about that. It was a script he had worked on and takes this to the uh, AFI when he becomes a student there. It was a screenplay, I believe, about infidelity is what they oh, said. Infidelity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which here's that theme again uh, early in his life. I think they paid him to work with Caleb Deschanel, and I forget who the other gentleman was, Yes, yeah. uh, to expand the script. And by the time he got to the end of it, he just did not like the script at all. Yeah, he hated it. Yeah, I think it was, what, 40 pages originally? And he was all padding. That was the movie. Yeah, he said it was all padding, and he said, that was the movie. Why do I need to make it 120 pages? If he believed more in himself, it probably could have been a feature film, because his pacing is different than, you know, traditionally, I think, one page of script is considered one minute of film. Mm -hmm. But Lynch's style, it... (laughs) One minute could just be on, you know, the first line somebody speaks. Yes. Be on the first minute. Some guy walking in is the first two minutes. Oh. You know. And what's fascinating is that was from day one for him. You know, that's how he saw films. Uh, that hasn't just... That's not new. It's not just uh, floor sweeping. That that started with his first screenplay. So then it goes into Eraserhead, and of course we we get many stories out of this. But I think of uh, his introduction to Jack Nance that, that he was actually really frustrated and grumpy. And what turns Jack around is when he's leaving this interview where mm-hmm. David feels like he's been real. He sees the roof rack on David's car and just admires it so much that they instantly become friends. Yeah, I thought that was a great story. I loved it. I don't know if it's any different in the audio, but. He yeah, it was just like he walked with him, and then they they became buddies. Yeah, yeah. But Jack Nance at the time, I'm assuming he was in he was an alcoholic or he was drinking it, probably at the time. Yeah, I can't so. remember the time where he was sober, but at some point, I think he told Lynch he didn't care anymore and he wanted to just drink. But. Yeah. I've heard the story where Catherine Coulson punches him in the face and like, because he calls her like, I think he calls her horse face. It's in the book. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, in yeah. The book. But I've heard this story before. I never heard why. And the reason seems to be that Catherine Coulson told on him. Like, basically, she said to Lynch, like, oh, you know, those coins you're using for the. He's stealing that, them. Yeah. Yeah. He was stealing them. That It was actually something I think didn't make it into a racer head. But mm-hmm. there was a whole thing with coins on the ground and he was picking him up trying to steal them for himself. Probably. Probably drinking. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That way. But it was That's interesting right. to see, like, oh, this is the reason they got into this fight. And it seemed like this kind of went, why they divorced. He, he demeaned her in public in front of people. And the fact that she punched him right. is awesome. I mean, yeah. go go for her. Good for her, right? right? But I, it was about trust, too. But yeah, 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 right. yeah. So Nance there is, like, pissed off at Lynch. It's like, yo, you keep all the money for yourself kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that got Lynch thinking about, like, okay, I'm going to – put together a co- contract on a napkin and basically share all the profits with this <clears throat> team of people. And to this day, I think they still get some royalty. The people that are still with us, they still get some kind of royalty off a of razor head. When we talked to Catherine Colson, I think I think she talked about this when we spoke with her, and she was saying that she was still getting money in and it helped pay for college for her daughter and things. But it, that's, that's cool. pretty amazing that Lynch kind of realized, hey, you know, these people have been with me four years or whatever it's been. Yeah. And, like, I, they, they deserve to have a piece of this, so. That's right, and, and that was in my notes that uh, in the book, Catherine Coulson is the one that confirms that story, uh, that she was still receiving paychecks. At the same time, I have noted here that this is also the same time, and this fascinates me, that he met uh, Sissy Spacek, who mm-hmm. married his friend Jack Fisk, huh. and she actually met him on the set of Eraserhead. Isn't that something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want to get into the young American? So I just kind of wrote down three sh- short little jots so that people kind of, you know, I hate to ruin all the material but it, you know one of the things that early on that you get is a lot of contention on the set and it's that mel brooks was 100 percent in on david lynch to make elephant man 
even after having made sure to review Eraserhead, there's this sense in this chapter that David Lynch goes and he feels like the out-of-place young American. Many of the cast were very confused at what he was doing there, helming this as well. Mm. And I believe at this time that Anthony Hopkins was yeah. drinking quite a bit as well, and they had quite a few contentious uh, moments on set. I'll, I'll admit it. I'm a little heartbroken here in that Anthony Hopkins, he didn't have the faith in David Lynch. And a typical actor, like, how the hell did this guy make it? How the hell, what makes him so special? Yeah. But... It, I, I believe in the book it, it, it said that he apologized later. I don't know when that apology happened, but, mm-hmm. it, but he, it was he, heartbreaking to hear that. Lynch asked him to do something like where there was a mirror and he refused to do that piece when he yeah, asked him. Like, he was have being actor, a typical actor. He's being typical actor. No, I don't know. You know? Uh, you hear those guys, like, probably not now because we're in the, you know, social media, but back then, I bet you a lot of actors. That considered themselves, you know, dignified actors at the time. They were doing serious things. They, well, even look at our twi- the Twin Peaks actors. I mean, by the second season, there was definitely a lot of people who were like saying, oh, I don't want to do that, or I want to change my character. And yeah. There be a lot of uproar about what they would do. So Anthony Hopkins probably was just like, why would I listen to you? You're nobody. Yeah. Like, you know, that's probably his attitude. I, it's nice to hear that he did apologize for yeah. it, but very heartbreaking to read about it. I kind of was saddened by that. So I had this one other moment that I pointed out in my piece, and I can't help but bring it out because it's uh, – and, and I'll actually read it. Uh, there's, there's a little highlight moment where David Lynch talks about being on the set of Elephant Man, and he says it was a moment of deja vu. So I'll read this. He says, we were living in this real British little house with knickknacks all around. And one day I was walking through the dining room and suddenly had a deja vu. Usually a deja vu feels like, oh, this has happened before. But as I entered the deja vu, it got slippery and it went and I went into the future. I saw it and I said to myself, the elephant man makeup is going to fail because I saw it. I saw the future. You can go into the future. It's not easy and you can't do it when you want to. But it can happen. Mm. And immediately my mind thinks what? Philip Jeffries yes. is slippery in here. Yes. yes. Oh. Yeah. Pete? He had a vision. Yeah. He had a Cooper vision. Um, but it did fail. He, he it, it sounded like he put a lot of work into this mask and he had a Jennifer Lynch come in and they put straws in her nose and her mouth so she could breathe. And, and they didn't like it. They didn't like it, and then they hired someone who did it professionally. What it was interesting to me that I learned is that how much Jennifer Lynch would be a part of his projects. Elephant Man is definitely a growing moment for Lynch, because when he was just like, when he tells Mel Brooks, I want to do everything I can, and Mel Brooks said, sure, go for it. And I don't know, in in the book, Mel Brooks is just like, you know, I've directed a couple movies. You're not going to have the time. And you have a seasoned director saying someone who's not directed a Hollywood picture yet to say, you could try it, but I don't think you're going to do it. And he was right. And I think it taught Lynch. Yeah, Lynch, like, he does his own thing. He can do it all. But when he's doing a Hollywood film like this, it's a lot to do. At the it's same a teachable time, moment for him. At the same time, 30 years later or whatever, uh, we have uh, Twin Peaks, uh, The Return, Season 3, and yeah. he did go back to doing everything. Like he, Well, he didn't he really did do everything. I mean, he had, they had professionals all around. Yeah, they did, but yeah. he still did, would make up lipstick. He's hands-on. he could do and he couldn't do, and they had a better yeah. understanding of that. From that. Uh, no, I totally agree. He's very hands-on, but I think as a first-time director, Mel Brooks is just like, you, you just got so much going on. You're not going to have time to do makeup and audio and lighting. You, you just kind of do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, but, I, yeah, I think he still likes to be hands-on with everything because he's that type of person. Right. And so you know, hearing the audio uh, book of it and you hear Lynch saying, I failed, and it's like, and I think he said it like three times he oh. failed, like about the makeup. It's like, it's like my heart breaks a little bit, like, oh, mm. you didn't fail. You ha- you just didn't have the experience and you didn't, and you, there's other people that do that for their living that yeah. can do that for you. Teachable I, moment yeah. in his career. And I, I, it's, it's a growing moment for Lynch. 
Absolutely. And the other thing in this section was real brief was that uh, he got his, a dog, I think partly for his wife, named uh, Sparky. And Sparky loved to bite water. And he. he and, this, and now we know where that dog came from. He was part of uh, Blue Velvet, Velvet, the beginning of Blue Velvet. Why is his dog biting the water? But that's what he did. That's what his. And thing. there's photos of the dog biting uh, like a stick and his wife's gosh. holding it. And the dog, it looks like she, she was spinning and they took stills. And the dog was just not letting go of the stick. And Sparky is also the name of the child in Dumbland? Yes. Oh, yeah. Mesmerized is the next section. And that's dealing with Dune. You know, Elephant Man was a, a success. I mean, it was really was a success. And then this Dune was kind of, it was really was a failure. And I think Lynch is so frustrated. I, mean, we, I think these are stories I've heard many times before yeah. that he didn't have final cut. And that made a big difference. A teachable moment yet again. Yeah. You know. The one piece I, I put down that I thought was interesting is that Dune was screened at the White House with Ronald Reagan. That's cool. <laughs> you know, we, we, in the last couple of weeks, we've all learned a lot about David Lynch. Um, and the Ronald Reagan thing, he, he did like Ronald Reagan. And I think Ronald Reagan represented, for a lot of people at the time, the apple pie America. The, yeah. you know, the clean cut manners um very formal uh gee golly whiz kind of america and you know he was a fan of that just i think he was a fan of who ronald reagan was maybe not his politics but maybe who that man was was ronald reagan a fan of dune or like how did that happen i think he was he was a fan of dune i think he liked the books and he, really? he was excited to talk to Lynch about it. And I think Lynch wanted nothing to do with it. Like, he was like, I am done with this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I think I remember him saying that Reagan just would not stop asking him questions about <laughs> the making of the Dune and how and he was just over it. Oh, <laughs> wow. That reminds me of a story, and I don't, I don't know if it's in the book or not. He directed a Michael Jackson uh, teaser for his album. It, it was not even a minute or two long, and all Michael Jackson wanted to do was talk about the Elephant Man. He was fascinated by the Elephant Man. And Lynch... He told him what he could. I guess that was the connecting point between Michael Jackson and David Lynch. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think that appears over in the – you can find some of that in the book uh, somewhere around chapters 10 and 11, the uh, section the people go up and they come down about Fire Walk With Me. Oh. It was around that time that uh, he was asked to do a video for Dangerous. Yes. And – yeah. So he talks about that and how he'd initially turned it down, speaking directly to Michael Jackson on the phone, said, I don't have any ideas for this. And he said, as soon as he hung up, ideas hit him. So he called back and I said, I have ideas for this. I'll do it, which I find fascinating. Yeah. When you watch that video, like I know it's on YouTube. It's very simple. Maybe at the time it was pretty grand. I mean, I didn't find it like, oh, my God. It was cool, though, that Lynch did that for Michael Jackson. I'm going to jump back to Dune real quick because I think there is a story of interest here. And that is about the actor Aldo Ray. While they're on the set in Mexico, David meets Aldo Ray and offered him one of the parts. I don't have it here in front of me which part that was. So he offered it and then Dino hears about it and he says, well, you know that guy's a drunk. David says, well, I want to give him a chance. So he goes to see him on the day of the shoot and he says that in the corner, there's Eric DeRay sitting there with his head hung who's leo from and his dad's Mm -hmm. laid out on the couch and he goes and puts a chair and says can you do it and he told him no but i don't think he ever forgot eric in that room wow yeah i found that absolutely heartbreaking and then you're thinking well you know gosh i mean who else could kind of portray that leo character i I wonder if that's what made lynch think of him Mm. as understanding what that character would be or or if that came into play at all his mom finds the actors during twin peaks he he would just be there to read lines with the other actors and i think lynch saw that or somebody saw that and said hey he actually does a good job as somebody like a leo because he was already reading the lines maybe with shelly or Mm -hmm. that's cool That's good to see. Uh, His life bleeds into Twin Peaks. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I learned in writing about this uh, for the the, the series is all I could really do were highlights and a couple of insights Mm. because there's so much material and so many names. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. It is. It's just antidote after antidote. I know. This is why I'm just taking my time and absorbing it. And um, it's it's such a great book. Yeah, Yeah, it is. And the next section is a suburban romance only different, and this kind of focuses on Blue Velvet. Oh, 
This is going to be a good chapter. This part where Dennis Hopper was originally supposed to sing in dreams, and uh, Dean Stockwell was helping him learn the song, and Dennis just couldn't remember the lyrics. And Lynch liked how Dennis and Dean were looking at each other, and I'm guessing that means that he liked the idea that maybe they were almost like a couple. Like, he kind of liked the way that they were going to singing together to get it. And then he realized that Dean should be the one to sing the song. And the other thing I thought was interesting is that a work light was left behind. It wasn't supposed to be there. None of the production people put it there. It was just there. And Dean thought it was for him, and he picked it up and started singing. A happy <laughs> accident. Happy accident. That is cool. Absolutely. And in that same scene, of course, we remember uh, Brad... Dorf dancing some kind of weird dance in the background behind him on the couch. Yeah. Oh, and he yeah. said they had found a, a dead snake in the road. And so Brad Dorf just improvised that, and David allowed it. He said he was fine with it, is what he says. That changes when you get to the return section, and you begin to hear that David became less, in his life, less interested in letting people improvise. Everything mm. had to be by the book. True. Mm, yeah, yeah. When you watch the uh, behind-the-scenes when someone says something, it's like he, you know in his head he knows exactly how he wants them to say it, and he makes them do it so many times. Yeah, I, I just remember the cop scene when he had the officer saying, "You know, we found this information," and how he keeps telling, "No, I want you to get lower. I want you to get lower." And he's got to bend down. He's like, <laughs> "Like you're," he's like, "I want you to feel like you're on." Broadway, Like, you've got to put your hands way out there. And he made the guy do it so many times, and he finally did it. But I was just like, wow, he really has his vision. Yes. I also think that, like, Lynch didn't have time to play as much um, in The Return, really. Yeah. He kind of like, I've got a script, I've got a deadline, we've got so much to do. And, like, I think that frustrates him that he couldn't do go off yeah. and do all the things. So he definitely can't have his actors start improv. He's like, there's no time for this, and we he, this is serious work. But mm. you're right, though. It's interesting to see that he didn't mind it as much in Blue Velvet. Right. And, and outside of that, I think in this chapter, you get a lot about his and Isabel uh, Rosalini's uh, relationship, which we've talked about. But I'm glad you said that because I put a line in my piece here that I'll just read again, where he said, we all had a blast and became really close in a place and we'd have all have dinner together. We'd see each other every day and everybody was there for a long period of time. And that doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. People come in quick now, then they go away and you don't have dinners. I don't know what's changed. Now it's like tremendous pressure tremendous and it just kills me i can't tell you shoots have to go faster blue velvet started in may and went until thanksgiving and the wow. days of long shoots like that are over hmm. that's too bad it, it, he's right yeah i mean but when you're working with someone else's money and they want yeah. movies are made in less than two months you know it's, yeah it's quick it's too bad though. yeah rob i the, you did a great stuff in your piece about uh, Elizabeth Taylor that I, I wonder if you could bring that up that's something that you shared in 25 years later site yeah yeah just at the end uh, so it was right after that quote that I talk about it. he shares this great story of having a so blue velvet does well uh, for him and he ends up at the Oscars and of course he doesn't win he loses to platoon with Oliver Stone but he, he says he's out at this party afterwards and Angelica Houston comes up to him he met John Houston while in Mexico working on Dune and so she says I know you know my dad would you like to go see him and of course he's very grateful and he, he so he goes to this back room and here's John Houston some famous people and there's Elizabeth Taylor and, and she comes over and tells him, David, I loved Blue Velvet, and this just elates him. But what he tells her in response is, I sure wish I had won instead of Oliver Stone because you kissed him. And she flags him down and he tells a story about bending down and he talks about going deeper and deeper into her lips and getting to kiss her and how amazing <laughs> well, uh, which is just hilarious and so I, I was dying to hear him retell this in the audible and he ends it there in the audible but in the book he talks about he met her a couple of years later and they kissed again uh, and he said and that night in his room he gets a phone call and it's Elizabeth Taylor and he tells this little story I don't have it in front of me that at the time she liked to get married all the time and he's like and I think she wanted to marry me marry me 
but I didn't want to marry Elizabeth Taylor, so that was the last time I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was listening to the audiobook, so it was only because of your article that it released, oh, the book is different, that you have this whole maybe getting married. <laughs> so now we're into the wrapped in plastic section, which is the Twin Peaks section. There's a part I thought was interesting that, so Lynch and, and Frost finished this script, and, and Mark Frost is telling this, and they have a meeting with ABC. It's a, it's a note meeting. One of the executives took out a list of notes out of his pocket, and, and they said, uh, I've got some notes if you're interested. And uh, David says, no, not really. <laughs> and the guy quietly puts his list back in his pocket. But I, I love that because that kind of place is where Lynch and Frost are basically saying, we're going to do it our way, and right from the top, we're, like, we're not going to have your input. And it seems like they've always said, for the most part, they had a lot of freedom doing Twin Peaks. I think they were, they were, their arm was twisted for uh, revealing the killer, but for the most part, they freedom to do whatever they wanted. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's true, for sure. And, and then I know kind of in there kind of so he meets him and then they began working on what but they had worked on so many projects it yeah. seems there there was the one um goddess goddess thank you it wasn't coming to me so they that had followed through of course I, I think he mentions they worked on the Lormirians and they laughed and had a good time writing mm -hmm. it but they kind of knew it wasn't going to go through and and then one saliva bubble with a story about they had steve martin and martin short tied to that uh, project isn't that something and there was something about – I'm sorry, I don't remember it, but uh, Mark, Steve Martin had gotten upset with David Lynch. Is that right? I don't remember that section now. I have to look that up. I don't remember that. But it wasn't because the, the company went bankrupt and that's why it – fell through or something? I, I think it was that the project fell through and there was a little bit of bad blood there that Lynch felt bad about. Now I gotta mm -hmm. look up and, and find that because, yeah, I think that would have been such a fun project if <laughs> that could have gone through. Uh, of course, then I have to imagine Steve Martin and Martin Short in this Lynch Frost world, and that that just weirds me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, those guys are crazy as it is. Yeah, that would be all everywhere. <laughs> And there's so many Twin Peaks stories. I mean, I, this is ones I've heard pretty much, at least the first part of it, that Al Strobel uh, was only supposed to do the hospital elevator scene. And that, I guess this is Mark Frost's idea, which makes so much sense that this was his idea based off of the fugitive. Mm -hmm. that Lynch goes on to say is that Lynch loved Al's voice and he, you know, he, his driver's driving him on the highway, a freeway there, and Lynch was just there and he all of a sudden he started writing through the darkness of future past. But it's, it was Al's voice that seemed to inspire him to come wow. up with this poem which i thought was really that's cool. cool yeah it was really good and then he meets uh tamblin uh at dennis hopper's birthday uh years earlier and promised him a role and sure enough he contacted him years later to do twin peaks that's something there's an interesting origin to the log lady on page 275 i'll leave that for readers uh because just for sake of time yeah like I said, you could just go on and on with these stories, but then you, what I found also in writing this, it was really hard to write because I thought, well, I don't want to rewrite the book. Yeah. I just yeah. need to talk about <laughs> connections. So In that next section about uh, Lost Highway, Finding Love in Hell, at the very beginning, Lynch says that you know he kind of lost interest in Twin Peaks, and it seems like it was really because Lynch and Frost weren't working together. It was almost like other people were taking over the show. I thought it was interesting. He says Twin Peaks became more of a TV show than a film. So even then, he was thinking of Twin Peaks as a movie. I mean, he looked at, like, the pilot and probably stuff he was doing as I'm making a feature film. Yeah, because that European ending could have just been the film if that show was done. Yeah. That would have been a Lynch film as is. Right. But even yeah. when I think he came back, I mean, when he when he came back for season two, that was a two-hour uh, premiere. Mm -hmm. And then I think he did do another one after that. But, like, for him, I guess he was coming in kind of, like, envisioning this is... In his own way, he's making a film each time, I think. Whereas the TV was kind of like mass production. It's like, okay, we've got to come up with a story. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. Oh, we got another one next week. And I think he hated that feeling. Yeah, as someone who, as we learned, ha likes to have control of his art, can you imagine someone like that coming into a TV scenario and then all of a sudden he's got to let it go to other people? Right. That's got to take a lot out of him. He's controlling when it comes to his projects. So maybe he felt like it's not mine anymore. It's yeah. everybody's. And, and it wasn't I, how his vision of the characters. I mean, he said exactly. he like something like Cooper. He didn't see Cooper in flannels, and he felt like he lost his way a little bit. Makes well, sense. And what's fascinating with that, we just talk about how he was kind of seeing it 
becoming television is that there is a little bit of talk on page 260 about Mark Frost's tension on the set mm. and he was kind of hurt that it had become David Lynch's Twin Peaks. If that's true, I can see that because Lynch was off doing Wild at Heart and he was doing other projects and here was Mark Frost you know, basically in the thick of things, at least for, for the first season, I think for sure. some of the second season where he was really laying out what the plot was, what, and figuring it all out. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think he, pr he probably was really hurt that like, hey, wait a minute, I see Lynch on Time Magazine and, and I, I worked on this project too. I mean, yeah. I co-produced it, I co-created it. Well, thankfully, I think our as a fan community, we're really kind of fixing some of that as we've talked about the return. We, uh, I mm -hmm. see a lot of credit coming back to Frost and I know at 25 years later we have some plans That's to awesome. begin highlighting his work more as well oh nice and it's interesting today frost isn't about lynch did this and frost did that like when we've talked to him he's very much about like this is our work together and mm -hmm. i think that was mm -hmm. really good that he doesn't suddenly say well this is all mine or this is all yeah, yeah. we're doing the return rewatch and and so I was covering part nine on Sunday, live tweeting on Sunday night. And one of the scenes that I brought up, uh, there's a part in this chapter that talks about a cut scene from the early screenings of Wild at Heart. And, and it dealt with that that terrible uh, Harry Dean Stanton kind of torture scene. And apparently they take off his head and stuck their heads inside his neck. And this was just too much for audiences. Mm -hmm. So David Lynch finally conceded and said, okay, maybe I went over the top here. And he takes it out. And I said, but you get that in the, in the return, you have Chantel and there's this talk of, oh, well, do you want us to torture him? And, and then later she, she'd she just rather get the food. She's too hungry to torture him. <laughs> and had she not been hungry and really what would that, if he had gotten to shoot that, would that have been him returning to that scene he had to cut? Yeah. That was just a side thought in my mind. Definitely. And like Lynch says is that, you know, for every director, there's a line you shouldn't cross or something like that, he says. Mm. He, I think he debated on whether with what Wild at Heart, did he cross a line? And like, that sounds like a disturbing scene. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. If I would anybody would have liked to see that. And I, I do wonder with the with the new Blu-ray out, or it's actually been uh, recalled, and I think it's coming out in August. Mm. Whether the, it would be one of the deleted scenes in there? Did he film it? It was filmed. Oh yeah, definitely. I do not believe it's going to appear in those deleted scenes. Okay. I, I think he cut it. Indefinitely. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. So yeah, I think there were hundreds of people that walked out of the theater and they did not like that at all. They were it like, did not work. No, it did not work. Oh, so it was shown. It was shown. People saw this. People saw. Wow. This. Yes. I saw I wish I was a fly on the wall during that. The ending of Wild at Heart. He he didn't want it to end on a down note, which I thought was interesting. And he was saying during that time period, we're talking the early '90s. He felt like it was kind of more popular to end things on a bad note. I think he was afraid people might think it was a sellout but to him it meant so much that he ended on a good note and i actually that's my favorite part of the whole movie <laughs> i guess i maybe yeah. i'm a sap i do love a happy ending it's a great part yeah. of the movie yeah it's and, a very heavy movie you right. have to have a palate cleanser at the end yeah or you're gonna be like what the hell did i just and, say and you and it brings in the whole wizard of oz thing mm -hmm. and cheryl lee in it which i yeah. think is great yeah so. So there's going to be a special feature on the Shout Factory that's doing the Blu-ray. I yeah. wrote about the release of the Blu-ray. Yes, uh, we were supposed I, to do something. I do have an early copy of it before they recalled it, and and so Barry Gifford talks about that happy ending and his and the exchange he has with David Lynch about him being willing to let him make that change. That's cool. Did, now, does your copy work? Uh, yeah, I think as. From what I understand from everybody, the only missing thing on that disc was on the main menu, there's no music playing. Oh, what? In the background. That's the whole that, recall? That yeah. So made it defective. Wow. So here's the funny thing is, I still have mine wrapped in plastic. I did get mine from Amazon. It did it, it did deliver. Oh, it, was funny, it was so funny that, like, but, I get an email saying that it was going to be recalled, and that the same day, I think, I, it came in the mail. <laughs> and I tried to, I couldn't order it anywhere. You cannot buy yeah, it right. anywhere. So, so. I, still, I still didn't mean to check it out. But, uh, and we were so, you know, you did a whole piece on it, and you mentioned us. Thank you. JC and oh. us, we were all supposed to get together, and uh, do a show on this. Yeah, and but then, none, none of us got it except for you. Except for me. And, and you haven't even opened it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do this. One of these days, we got to talk to JC about when we want to do, because she's never seen the full All of One of the Heart before. Oh, she's seen some of it. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, people going up and then they go down. 
I guess I want to talk about if there's, there's still a little bit about Firewalk with me, and they like there was a lot of stuff cut, but it was cut because it didn't fit in the film, not because it was too long. The film uh, is what it needed to be. Mm-hmm. And I think that was interesting. You always you always wondered like these missing pieces. Why were they cut out? And he's saying that's what it was just meant to be. And I'd always questioned was like, oh, was he planning on making a second movie? Like, was he saving all this stuff for something later? And it's just I think he just had all these ideas, and he realized you know at the heart of it, it was probably about Laura Palmer. You made the right call. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and as far as having other ideas, I know in this section on page uh, 306, it talks about uh, Ronnie Rocket comes back up. He gets the three picture deal with this, uh, is it Sibby 2000? Yeah. Initially, uh, I think this is right. There was a plan to do more, two more Twin Peaks movies. And Ronnie Rocket was going to be one of the three before the – I think the company went bankrupt again wow. and and ended up losing the three-picture deal. And, and one of the notes I have about it also is just kind of talking more about his life and his way of doing things as his driver. They were going, and he saw some woman in a walking on the sidewalk, and he said, stop, stop, stop. Go out and get her number. Mm. And so he goes and gets her number, and he can't, he's like, what are you going to do with that? He's like, I don't know yet. I'll call her if I need her. And, and that was it. <laughs> it, it went on. And, and sure enough, he called her back, and she was the woman in the trailer park. What about my hot, hot water? water? Yeah. <laughs> that is exactly correct. And this section that it was based on, there's a quote from Lynch, and he says, you know, well, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but he's like, he's saying, you know, HBO didn't want hotel room, and ABC hated on the air. And he basically, Lynch basically says, people go up, and then they usually go down. And if they come back up after they've been down, they've get, got staying power. But I thought it was really powerful because this seems to be a low point in his, like, he was on top of the world and he wild at heart and Twin Peaks and everything seemed to be great. And then mm. all of a sudden these other projects he's doing are not panning out as well. And then another point of the book that I point out here is that one of the things you'll notice as you're reading the book is that his memoirs, his sections start to get really short yeah. at this point. You're right. Where earlier he had been more kind of elaborating. I, I, I noticed even in the audio book, the portions mm. get smaller and smaller and smaller. And wonder why that is. Maybe because he feels like, well, this is kind of known. Like we, you, we're, we're closer to more recent times, and people should know a lot about me by this time, or there's yeah. nothing to share, I guess. Uh, next door to Dark, which is Lost Highway, which is my favorite David Lynch film. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just have something here about Peter Deming, who is you know who does the photography. Uh, he he mentioned that uh, on the last night of shooting Lost Highway, Lynch asked what was going to happen to the shack, and if he could blow it, <laughs> if he could blow it up. <laughs> what to me is crazy is like I just imagine this is part of the script, but it wasn't, and it, and he was able to get gasoline and just do it. And it was it's such a beautiful image, this shack on fire. And I always kind of look at it as there's a, there's an internal thing. This isn't just a physical thing. This mm-hmm. is something in the mind as well. And I, it was. It's so cool to hear that story. Yeah, I think that's right. It, and I only have one note, so maybe I'm like Lynch. Maybe my input's getting shorter and shorter. Uh, he talked about a project, uh, Dream of the Bovine. Yeah. And here, it, he tried to get Marlon Brando, who was very blunt with him. And I think, David, that since you get is he was pretty tickled at just how totally over Hollywood Marlon Brando was at this point. He was just done with the Hollywood thing. And, uh, so there's a really funny story in there that Marlon Brando randomly showed up at his house one day and David said he didn't have much food in the house, but that's what Marlon asked him for is, what food do you have around here? <laughs> and, and he said, man, I don't know. Let's go look, Marlon. Uh, and, and so he had, I think he set a banana and a tomato and Marlon said, that'll be good. So he eats the which is just totally intimidating to Lynch, you get the sense. But the project that they talked about, he says that uh, Brando at the time was really into cross-dressing, and he wanted to do a project where he and Harry Dean Stanton would get to wear women's clothes and have tea time together and just tell <laughs> stories. And, and Lynch said he just it just kills him that he, he never let him do it. He's like, all I had to do was just turn on the camera. Oh, <laughs> that is great. But do, do you take that as that's, that they were doing it in his house anyways? They were Maybe they really were having tea time? And... It, it, it makes me think that maybe they actually got together. Yeah. yeah. Did that for a oh, second, man. Which, Isn't that which funny? I, you know, 
that I can only dream about. Another little piece on Lost Highway was that um, I'd heard this before that like they'd used David Lynch's house to film the Madison's house. Like really, that they'd use. I remember mm-hmm. hearing that, but there was like it was always it wasn't always quite clear, and it's a little more clearer now that this was Lynch's third house he had. But the interesting thing is that he had houses right next to each other. Like he'd have one house, and somebody would uh, move out of the house next door, and he would just buy it. And then another person would move out, and you just buy it. Buy the whole neighborhood. <laughs> he had a compound, like his own little area. But one one house would be his studio, ah. and then like, and he had one for the filming of of Lost Highway. But I thought that was really fascinating. It's like, oh, I see. It's not that like he doesn't have a house now because he's letting he's doing Lost Highway. It's just like, oh, this is my third house. So I, that house was his house that they filmed in. So yeah, that's so, cool. Yeah, he tells a story about. When he was little, living in a house similar to that, the house, he bought the house because it was very familiar to him about when he grew up and someone knocking on the door. He went to go look and there was nobody there. And that's the whole knocking with nobody there in the movie. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure if I remember that being exactly in the book. But Dick Laurent is dead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, that's what it was. And he heard someone say someone's name over the speaker. Yeah, I think in, in a sentence he I said think that. that is- yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is in there, but it wasn't. I don't remember anything about it being related to his childhood. I think he just mentioned about there was somebody there, and by the time he got there, there was nobody there, and he thinks that the person went to the wrong house. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've heard that story a million times, but it's still it's a great it's story. So, so you, I really recommend everybody get the audiobook because you get to hear Lynch speak. I mean, it's mm. there's nothing like Lynch talking and sharing his stories. And, I know. Uh, I feel like we're kind of running out of time, but I briefly that you know the happiest of happy endings we get to talk about. I was so happy they brought up DavidLynch.com because you know I was a member of DavidLynch.com, and to me, I I really think he was ahead of his time. And if we had DavidLynch.com membership now, I think it would really take off. Like I think he was hoping this ten dollar a month revenue thing would take off, and he, it, they could really make money off. He of was it. so ahead of his time. He was so that, ahead of everybody's his time. doing that now. Yeah, yeah. But it was but it was so cool to just hear a little bit more information and I feel like that's part of his history that he kind of went away from making films and started doing these little projects and sharing it with that community and I think I've mentioned this before but it was kind of cool he had a chat room and I get to, he, I was in there with him on the chat room and <laughs> me being a geek it was just be like I really like Lost Highway <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like oh I'm kicking myself it's like I should have said there should have been a better conversation with him and can I skip to uh, my log is turning gold I think we need to yeah, yeah. let's go there Sabrina Sutherland is like the unsung hero and like I think we said it on the show to her We've just said like I think she's somebody special. I think she mm-hmm. made it. She made a big in- impact on the return. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I realized how, to what degree. I mean, Lynch is basically saying that there might have not been twin be the new Twin Peaks without her because wow. he, he did walk away, and there was that whole. And I'm so glad they went into more detail about this whole idea that he wasn't happy and it was about money. And it doesn't seem like it wasn't about I'm not making enough money. It the fascinating thing is it's like. Showtime understands through money in terms of episodic shows, mm-hmm. and Lynch was talking about movies and like in in, the ma- in making a movie, you have like a whole crew that stays on the whole time. You know, like you have a painter that will be there every day. You'll have you'll just have crew people, and I guess in television you have those people that they do their job and then they're no longer part of the series. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where there was some some confusion between Showtime and David Lynch. But it was Sabrina who came along and they said, I'll work out the money, we'll figure it out, and we'll make it work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So go go, Sabrina. You know she's important when she's actually going to be at, like signing things at uh, Comic-Con. <laughs> I mean, what other show do you have the producer, one of the producers, signing autographs? You know, it's kind of special in this community that she is getting a lot of accolades because any other show, I couldn't tell you who the producer was and why that person would be signing yeah. autographs at San Diego Comic-Con. Right. You know? As I read this, I still don't realize how important and special she is in the sense mm. that, like, so in November, it'll be 10 years that she's worked full-time with Dave 
David Lynch. When I say full time, like she's just she's the regular uh, in house producer. Rock. She, I think of some jobs where okay, you do a job and then you go your separate ways. Like I. I remember we were talking to Sabrina, and it's like, okay, you're still working on Twin Peaks. The show is over. And then I kept on thinking, so when do you walk away from this? And then as you read this book, it's like, oh, she doesn't walk away from this. Like She, she lives it. So here's that stuff with Lynch. He only has a few people that are full-time. Like, he has an engineer who runs his studio. He has... <laughs> An in-house editor, he has a handyman, he has an archivist who manages his art and exhibits, Mm -hmm. and a a personal assistant, and an in-house producer, Sabrina Sutherland. And these are, like, the full-time people. And I think Mm. that's fascinating to think that, like, okay, (laughs) Sabrina might be done with Twin Peaks, but then she's on to Lost Highway Blu-ray, and she's on to other things that she's working on. And it's not like... His signing, she's there. Right. Yeah. And I think she really is there representing... To some degree, maybe David Lynch. And yeah. I don't think it's almost like she's undercover, and we don't even realize how valuable she is. She was at the uh, New York uh, Festival of Dis- uh, Disruption. She was, yeah, she was at the Festival of Disruption and stuff, and right there by David Lynch's side. And mm-hmm, so. Mm-hmm. I guess sometimes you see other projects, other TV shows, other things. It's like, oh, yeah, there's a producer. And then when the show is over, they go their separate ways. And I find it fascinating. It's great. Yeah. Mm. And he does give her a lot of the accolades. And I think maybe it's in the audio version. It could be in both. Uh, he speaks directly to that. And he says some people come and they don't even know what producing is. Mm. And he said Sabrina Sutherland stepped into the role and she just got it. He's like, she knows absolutely what this is, role is. And he goes on to say, you know, she's a producer, she's an uh, accountant, she's an agent, she's a lawyer, and she's a business manager. But he sees her in all these different roles, wow. and she's so much more than just, you're producing this show. You're also looking at the whole investment and stuff. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. so there's probably three big points that, you know, I think it's easy as a viewer of Lynch to want to come to this and say, I want to know all the secrets. And, and there may be a couple in here. And... So, so one of those is we get a little insight to the origin of the green glove, and the other is about the father statue. Ooh. The statue in Las Vegas that Dougie's looking at. We do find out the inspiration, and like I said, this is for David Lynch, but I don't think anyone else's interpretations. We had thought of it as the maybe David Bowie mm, could have been yeah. posing for that. And uh, But what we find out that it actually was for David is that is based off a picture he has of his father. Wow. But then we get the green glove, and I, I kind of wanted to talk about this because I mentioned it also in my Wild at Heart coverage on the Blu-ray just as for fun. What David Lynch says and is the green glove is an idea he had had very early on, and it was meant for somebody else, mm-hmm. and that was Jack Nance. Oh, wow. And when he doesn't something. specify whether that was for Twin Peaks or another project. Ah. Uh. One thing you'll say about Lynch is he is loyal. He really does want to bring the people that he's worked with into his life again. And mm. I thought about Jack Nance and that he had suggested Jack Nance for the Elephant Man. Which yeah. I, don't know, I thought that was That's interesting. Not- <laughs> I am not a monster. I'm a human being. It would not have worked. John Hurt was perfect. Jack Nance would not have been able to do it. Oh, uh, but it's so cool. I yeah. can, can you imagine that? Uh, those are great insights. So the green glove he could have worn. I mean, it would be interesting. To, I would love to have thought it was with for Twin Peaks. Wouldn't that be something? Or the guy who's them gone fishing then becomes the hero in the end. And he's kind of done that before. Lucy became a hero, and she's not. That really isn't her role usually. Yeah. So why not? That's true. That's true. That's true. And it kind of like a lot of us speculated that that episode of The Return was very Mark Frosty. Yeah. With the green glove. We, I mean, I, I, we, a lot, a lot of us associated the green glove plot line that could have been a Mark Frost thing. Yeah. But it's interesting that it wasn't. This was a, an idea. It they could have been a combination. Had. It could have been like Lynch is like, I had this idea. Yeah. A green glove. And Frost is like, we can use it as a superpower. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're right. Definitely. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> so there was one more, and he talks about the frog moth. Where we first heard it, at least as fans kind of keeping up, uh, he mentioned it. This is on the special uh, features for Inland Empire. And he tells the story of him, and I, I guess, was it Jack Fisk that he went across seas with? Yes. They were traveling on the train, and he yes. says when they stepped off and they saw the drinks with all the different colors, that there were just all of these uh, moths leaping up like grasshoppers. Yes, uh, yes, I remember that. Yep. And so that is the inspiration he used for this. Wow. I thought of that. Would, yeah. Um, yeah, they went abroad. They didn't have uh, much money. I think 200 $300 
and they they blew wow. through the money in like a couple weeks, and Lynch just wanted to go home. He said it was a horrible time, but. Yes, I remember that the, the frog moth stuff, and I thought the same thing. I was cool. like, "That's definitely the inspiration there." With Twin Peaks, we have uh, Everett McGill and how he mentions about the Big Ed Norma getting together scene, and he says, "You know, they, we had the, the Lynch played the music, and they had that moment, and they did it in one take, no reshoots. It was just nice. one take. Like this is Everett saying Lynch was crying like a baby." Like, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Like, I I guess I can say I felt like I was tearing up over that. Like, that was a beautiful scene that we were waiting for 25 years to see. And I love that, like, Lynch was moved by it as well. What if that was, like, Lynch thinking about, his, his, you know, his one true love who got away? Oh, he had a lot of love. He got it's, Judy. It was I, David I, and Judy. And that was in his mind going... That could be. I think you know. After reading this, I feel like uh, David Lynch's true love is art. Yeah. Like I, I mean, like, that is his true love, and like he loves women. But I don't know. I mean, you. Want you're right. You're right. And you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the people that, that worked for Lynch had to say was that um, if everything lined up perfectly, he probably would say, "Sure, let's do it." We're talking about Twin Peaks again, but he's not going to waste his time at negotiating table. It has been this weird thing where Showtime isn't saying Twin Peaks is over. And they, they keep saying, oh, we're just waiting for Lynch to find out what's happening. And then Lynch is saying, I have nothing else to say about well, no, this. no, Isn't there a new rumor right now that Lynch said that he does have a story to tell? It was an interview he did, and they were talking about the Carrie Page scene. Ah, yes. Asking if anything was calling him. And he said, I don't have the direct quote, but he said, there is a calling but there are some disturbances. I keep wondering they're hinting at that, like, this is their uh, passive-aggressive way of saying to Showtime, we're willing to do stuff, but you have to meet us close. Well, to put even more intrigue into the Lynch mythos, he, there, he was spotted at Netflix. Yes, he was. There's a photograph of him in Netflix, and he had a meeting. Because people just don't go to Netflix to hang out. You know, there was well, a meeting. Well, Rob, can you remind us that he had a project before the return? Can, do, do you have your uh -huh. notes? So after Inland Empire got mixed reviews, it says, Then in 2010, he wrote an incredible script called Antelope Don't Run No More. And he shopped it around, but nobody offered him the funding. He felt he needed to make it. When he couldn't get it financed, I don't think he was horribly upset, though. David believes that if a thing is meant to be, it'll happen. Set mostly in Los Angeles, Antelope Don't Run No More braids threads from Mulholland Drive and Inland Empire into a narrative fantasia that incorporates space aliens, talking animals, and a beleaguered musician named Pinky. It's impressed everyone who's read it is one of the best scripts Lynch has ever written. Wow. Wow. Thank you for reading that, Rob. That is really something. And, huh? you know, if anybody's going to throw money at anything, Netflix just throws money everywhere. Why not, right? <laughs> they do, except I think HBO just said that they need to be Netflix and expand, so maybe he's got more opportunities. Yeah, yeah right. I still believe, I've been saying this all along, I still believe that Mark Frost and David Lynch are writing a script right now for the next Twin Peaks. I know I'm crazy, but I feel like they already started it, and it might take them five years again, or whatever, but I feel like they've already started working on it. And well, Lynch if work Lynch is working on this project for Netflix... I bet you he maybe maybe. I'm saying I mean you could give you could do a year or whatever it's going to take for this project, and then the next project goes back to Twin Peaks. I mean, you, you got your fantasy going. <laughs> that got his fantasy. I'm not giving oh, up hope. Not <laughs> <laughs> it would be cool. I mean, this, we've said this over and over again. I, I mean, it, it would be nice if Showtime let him come back and maybe he did a movie or right. or shorter run or he did the same thing where i don't want it to take another five to six years that yeah. would stink but um when it comes out it'll be good right. yeah at the same time i understand now that if they did any other twin peaks it most likely would be on another cliffhanger you know what i mean like i don't yes. know if mark frost and lynch ever want to really neatly tie it into a ribbon like i feel like they always want to leave you thinking about you know the next time they come back we could possibly never see cooper again or maybe it's going to be richard and carrie and yeah. what if yeah oh, exactly uh, what if that what if it's 16 episodes of richard and carrie yep and cooper 
Cooper's just gone now, and oh, man. and then it ends on another cliffhanger. I know. Do you want that? I don't know. <laughs> yes, I, I do. I, I do. want that. I'll take anything. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Says yeah. Twin Peaks. Yeah. yeah. Well, Rob, this is really something. I mean, there's so much more, and I really think people, if you guys haven't gotten the book or you haven't gotten the audio book, I really would recommend picking it up. <clears throat> Definitely. And you should also be going to uh, 25 Years Later site and reading your your weekly column. I mean, so this is going to go on uh, for uh, when? When does this end? How long does the column go on for? Oh, I um, I want to say the first or second week of August we will finally round it out because uh, we're just doing the one a week. Yeah. And, but we're we're covering two chapters at a time, and uh, but but what's nice is you're going to get as, as different authors tackle it, you're going to get a different perspective on it, and uh, and hopefully it adds to your reading. Or if you haven't read it, but and you're not terribly afraid of spoilers, it could kind of give you just enough of a hint of what you're going to get when you do pick it. Mm. Well, yeah, I'm really enjoying what you guys are doing, and, and you guys do great work. And uh, what else? Uh, is, is, you're probably you're, you're probably just focused on this. Are there is there any other projects you're working on at 25 years later? We're doing a feature called Pod People, where we look at the Twin Peaks podcasters, and we're interviewing you all. And the first part I did was with the Diane podcast. Oh, right? nice! And that Good is people. out. It. So if you haven't read that, please go read that. It's fascinating, and and. Now, this one's going to be a little weird, which makes 100% sense. Uh, the Counter Esperanto is who I'm working with. So they have taken my questions into their podcast, which will be coming out within the week. And you can listen to our distance interview on their episode. And then on Sunday, I'll release the full transcript with three exclusive questions that they answered just for the site. Nice. Awesome. It's sort of like a room to dream. Yeah, you're gonna have your own bonus. Yeah, <laughs> audio ver. It's an audio version of your article. That's right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rob. This has been really something else, and you you really did your homework, and I've really been enjoying your pieces. And uh, we got to have you on again, and I hope you'll come back for the community rewatch as well. We loved having you be a part of that. Oh, I can't wait! Thank you so much for having me. We really appreciate it. And now, John Bernardi from Twenty Five Years Later site shares with us Twin Peaks, Las Vegas. This week on Twin Peaks Las Vegas, Janie E. talks Dougie into trying out for NASCAR and the Pink Girls take Sunny Jim on a nature study. We jump right into the show as Janie E. looks fiercely into a mirror. I timed eight seconds of silence before she momentums her way into a hysterical self-pep talk about how I deserve a life, a better life, in the fast lane, and my tiger can do this. I've seen him drive. He can beat all of them, and he'd look so good on camera. And so would I, honestly, though I'd need to straighten my hair and find a good rotation of three new pairs of shoes. Let's make sure to stop off at Levon's on the way home. That, that's how confident I am that this is going to happen. And so on and so forth, and constantly adorable. Then she march bounces downstairs with the camera following her all the way to where Sonny, Jim, and Dougie are eating lunch. I love how Janie E. springs the you're going to drive in NASCAR plan on Dougie and doesn't even give him the time to finish chewing his sandwich to answer. Not answering must be a way of saying yes, according to Janie E. Before she says, I know a guy, as if it's already cleared to happen. Which, of course, it is, because two scenes later, we're looking at Dougie behind the wheel of a genuine NASCAR car. But we're not there yet, because through Janie E.'s entire kitchen monologue, she's also packing Sonny Jim's backpack and shoving him out the door just before the Mitchum's limo even honks their horn. It's like Janie E. is tapped into something and the world's just working for her. This is a good choice for her character in this new pilot. Let it be known, this show treats Janie E. like a force of nature. A note about how this show is filmed? Right up until Janie E. walks past the coffee maker, it appears to be done all in one take, which is impressive. With the upstairs, downstairs, and the stairway included as it was, not to mention the street and limo scene from the front door, I think they're filming the Jones house scenes on location in a real house. As far as the rest of the show, I'll talk about the Dougie and Sonny Jim halves of the episode one at a time, rather than bouncing back and forth between them like we see it. Anyone following the rest of our site's Season 3 analysis knows why Dougie would be driving the number 9 car, but on this show, no one makes a thing out of it all, at all, or even winks at it. I love how even as a sitcom, Twin Peaks can work on multiple levels. 
It was honest fun to see Dougie with the hefty racing gloves clamp onto the steering wheel and Janie E needing to help him get his helmet on correctly. Some things never change, even though Dougie does a better job acting like he's an active participant. It was an interesting choice to film the actual time trials from a fixed position, as if it's from the crowd seats, where no one turns their heads to follow the cars. The shot focused on the back half of the track, let the cars go through the frame until they're off camera, and we hear them rumble through the closest part of the track without seeing them, and eventually the cars come back in the shot at the back of the course. I get that the show's going for the theme of cycles and circles, and the sound design made it feel like we were in the seats, but why keep the camera so still? There was so much action happening on the track itself, but most of everything in frame was static. It took going to the crowd shot near the end of the scene before anything was filmed like an action sequence, and then it was only to see Dougie's supporters be happy to cheer on Dougie while, be, while wearing these ambiguous expressions, as if maybe they didn't even know if Dougie did well enough to qualify for a real race or not. Sunny Jim had a much more peaceful day out with the girls on their nature study, Candy, Sandy, and Mandy particularly standing out from the forest in their pink dresses. And I love how lush their hike scenes looked. The forest is different than the Pacific Northwest, but no less beautiful. The way Sandy spoke about all the flora and fauna around them, it sounded almost musical, and slightly comical because she's describing all of this action, yet we see such stillness around them. If you told me Candy's random non sequiturs would not be the highlight of the scenes she's in, I wouldn't have believed you, but Sandy carried the forest scenes ridiculously easily. I'm not sure how they're planning on characterizing Sonny Jim in this show yet. The comedy that came from him was mostly reaction shots, as he almost laughs every time Sandy interrupts him. But you can tell Sonny Jim loves when people are passionate about things. Did anyone else notice the shot of ducks on the lake followed the same kind of formula as the NASCAR track shot? If you notice behind the picnic lunch scene, the ducks were actually swimming in a circle, in and out of frame. Don't know how they got the ducks to do that, almost wonder if they were somehow animatronic. The last scene was late that night, after the sun had gone down at least. Janie E and Dougie come in from the garage after their what should have been celebration meal, both acting stuffed to the gills. Dougie seemed nonplussed about not making a spot on the racing team, but Janie E was still fluffing up his ego anyway, for her own benefit I assume. You could tell it revved her motor, whether or not he could make a career out of that driving, and some of her innuendo was positively filthy, so we know she came to peace with the day's outcome. A slower moving life will work for her just fine after all, it seems. And before it veered too far off in that direction, the knock on the door led to one of the more endearing moments of the episode when Bradley Mitchum carries a fast-asleep Sonny Jim from the car to the boys' bedroom. Chaney E. got to tuck him in, she and Dougie got to share a really sweet look, and as soon as the men exchange thumbs up and Bradley turns to leave, Chaney E. looks up at Dougie and her expression changes from mom to tiger. Cut to credits and the most yakety sax inspired music I've heard in a long time. This pilot was character-based like any good sitcom, but it feels like it just doesn't want to be a sitcom. The whole show hits me in an Arrested Development way of bringing humor out of absurdity, but it all still has the look of paintings on the screen. Maybe it'll look less that way as the scenes won't always be outside in nature, though for Sandy's sake I hope they get some time outside so she can rhapsodize again. But based on how they filmed the outside of the house, I think this show is going to be gorgeous the whole way through. And before you ask, I have no idea why the Jones House's mailbox was focused on for so long. Maybe it's foreshadowing for the future, but it might just be a statement on an old system like snail mail, or maybe the shot just could be there for mood. There's lots of reasonable answers, so let's just wait to see before we turn it into a theory on life. If it comes to nothing, though, it'd be weird they left it in the show with all the other stuff going on. We could have had another Sandy monologue about a different kind of butterfly or something to go along with her take on squirrel hibernation. Sandy and Janie E. were obviously the standouts, but Phil Bisbee, who wasn't given a single line the whole show, deserves a mention for getting into the spirit next to Bushnell, Janie E., and Sonny Jim in the NASCAR stands during the time trials montage. And his prop is a classic already. The mustard yellow pennant with the lime green letters D and J was, a, was as glorious as it was hideous. I expect to see that for sale in the Showtime store one of these days, and I think I would even buy it when it gets here. 
A lot happens this first episode. Dougie's entire NASCAR audition and Sonny Jim's full day of nature study all over the course of the half hour. But it doesn't feel like much of anything happens in this pilot. Not sure what to make of this, other than there's a blatant repetition, whether it's in camera angles or specifically mentioned in dialogue, that says, slow down. My favorite of these being Dougie obeying the yield sign on the way to the audition and Janie E saying, oh, come on. The only thing I don't know about is that credit song. It's goofy as hell, but somehow not entirely incongruous. It could grow on me or I could end up hating it. A truly confusing choice, however you look at it, but I'll take the show's advice and not jump to conclusions about it. When I heard the topic of this episode involved race cars, I was skeptical at first, but it turned out to be a cute show based around people who love each other. I'll take this little burst of compassion in a TV landscape otherwise filled with anti-heroes and monsters. Not sure where the dramatic tension will come from, though I suspect it'll mostly be from misunderstandings, but for a pilot, it introduces us to a status quo I'm happy to return to. This has been John Bernardi, on behalf of 25 Years Later site. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments, in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or anywhere else we are. And I will see you in two weeks. Thank you, Rob Kang, for being on today's show. And a big thank you to John Bernardi for sharing that little audio for us and it's something we'll be doing uh, periodically. Yes, and, right? you can, and you can go to 25yearslatersite.com and you can check out he's doing it bi-weekly and go check out the next episode. And with all that, Ben, I'm so glad we had Rob on the show because we got to talk about all the news that's, that's happened with Netflix and everything else. I've been on vacation. We've had some weeks off in the studio. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to come back. <laughs> just gonna... Ben's uh, been playing, playing video, video games, games you know. Like living the good life. You yeah, know, yeah. It's it. summertime. I know. Um, but... That's why we don't take time off because I really, like, we did two weeks which in a row where we didn't, weren't here and I was kind of like, ah. I'll wait another week. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad we're back. It's good to be back in the studio. And if you want to send us a message, send us at TwinPeaksUnwrapped at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook. We're kicking butt on Facebook, getting a lot of likes, a lot of uh, interaction going on there. Twitter? Twitter is always a, a awesome. Twitter. Great community. Wonderful community. I love the people there. Yeah. Um, and subscribe to us on Spotify. Uh, we're on Spotify while you're, you're gaming, Ben. You could be listening to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. And so should you. We're also on iTunes. Give us that five-star review. Nice little comment. It boosts us in the ether of iTunes. It will get us uh, more visible to other Twin Peaks fans. And um, you can check us out at TwinPeaksUnwrapped.com. And, you know, uh, if you like what you heard from Rob and John, check out our partners, 25yearslatersite.com. And there's so many great articles. I mean, they're doing two articles a day, and we have lots of Twin Peaks info and a great community there. Definitely. All right. And with that being said, we are out of here. Next week, we got someone very special, and the hint is it will connect to this episode. That's in the some only way. hint. Some way. Yeah. In some way. These two episodes will connect. Okay. All right. That's all I'm giving. See you guys next week. Hey.